What really happens behind convent walls? There's something about a convent girl that we'll find out about at the slightly later time of 10.55. And that's after an extended news at 10 with Alistair Burnett and Julia Somerville. Helicopters sink and scatter Iraqi gunboats. Allied planes destroy an Iraqi armoured column. President Saddam insists, no chance of my losing. South Africa's two black leaders say, end the civil war. And the campaign to help pensioners keep their dignity. Good evening. Royal Navy Lynx helicopters led an attack on a flotilla of small Iraqi gunboats off Kuwait today, they detected them on radar, then went in with sea skewer missiles. Other Allied aircraft, including RAF Jaguars, joined the attack. A British military spokesman said four of the gunboats were reported sunk and another 12 damaged. Also on day 13 of the Gulf conflict, America said Allied aircraft caught an Iraqi military column in the open and destroyed 24 tanks, armoured personnel carriers and supply vehicles. Iraq said its ground forces attacked Allied positions in Saudi Arabia last night. It said they crossed the border in three places, penetrating up to 12 miles. The Americans said there'd been one attack. And Iraqi radio said a captured Allied airman was killed by Allied bombing. Baghdad gave no details, and there's no confirmation of the report. The Iraqi gunboats caught by the Royal Navy in the northern Gulf today were said to be carrying small numbers of troops. They were spotted by helicopters from the destroyer HMS Gloucester and the frigate HMS Brazen. Our correspondent Michael Nicholson is aboard HMS Gloucester and sent us this report. This afternoon, Royal Navy Sealings sought helicopters from the British warships Gloucester, Cardiff and Brazen, located and attacked a convoy of 17 Iraqi patrol boats off the Kuwaiti coast, moving south from Kuwait City. For the first time in this war, the pilots launched sea skewer missiles and one made a direct hit. As the convoy scattered, the ships called in American intruder bombers from aircraft carriers in our battle group who bombed and strafed the boats. It is not yet known how many were sunk or what the casualties are. It is my understanding that the convoy was either taking troops and weapons to reinforce nearby oil rigs or were carrying Iraqi commandos intending to land them on the Saudi coast tonight to attack Allied installations there. Cameraman Eugene Campbell flew aboard Gloucester's Lynx to within three miles of the Kuwaiti coast and Kuwait City itself. He reports that smoke from the Allied air attacks is rising above it. He also flew to within one mile of Wellhead 23. That's the wellhead that has been pumping the oil into the sea and which at first the Iraqis claim had been damaged and ruptured by Allied bombing. Campbell's pictures confirm that the Wellhead 23 and its pipeline, standing eight miles out to sea, is undamaged and intact. He also confirms that the oil flow appears to have stopped, indicating that the Allied bombing of the pumping station has been successful. This is Michael Nicholson aboard HMS Gloucester in the Northern Gulf. Well, Michael Nicholson is on the phone again now. Michael, do you have any fresh information on the incident you've just described? Well, Julia, simply to update the number of boats that have been sunk, uh, I reported earlier today that one had been sunk. That was sunk by Cardiff's Lynx. Four more were later sunk by the American intruder bombers. Another four have been beached. So altogether, nine casualties. We're still waiting to see how many Iraqis have been killed in this attack. We do not know what it is yet. Michael Nicholson, thank you very much for that. We're getting reports of a bomb alert at a club in London. The London Ambulance Service say the detonator of a bomb went off at Brooks's club in St James's Street. It appears that the bomb itself did not go off and there are no reports of any casualties. There'll be more news later in the programme. By far the biggest part of the Allied attack in the Gulf is still being conducted from the air. Another two and a half thousand missions were flown today, hitting troops, command centres and supply dumps. 
Much of the attack is aimed at pounding the experienced Republican Guard troops. The Allies say the Guard's morale is bound to be weakening. Any Iraqi unit moving in the open is a likely target for the Allied planes. For more news of the fighting, over to Alistair Stewart in Saudi Arabia. Allied sources have indeed confirmed tonight that Iraqi troops did attack a small Saudi border post, wounding three Saudi guards. They say an Iraqi officer was also killed in the exchange. It's all part of a developing pattern, with each side probing the other for signs of weakness and strength. As Jeremy Thompson reports, the Allied effort involves sneak and peak nighttime reconnaissance, followed up by daylight strikes by Allied air forces and artillery. Ghosting into the sky, hornets of the US Marine Air Corps on their way to sting Saddam's ground troops. For 10 days, they've been pounding Republican guard positions in southern Iraq, sapping the strength of the world's fourth largest army. The constant bombing is designed to damage and demoralize Saddam's top soldiers. Colonel Bill McMullen, a platoon commander in Vietnam, now leading the Death Angels squadron, has no doubts about his objectives. Our intent is not to go up there to dismay anybody. Our intent is to go up there and kill them. Ground crews race to keep up with the intensified raids, loading the Hornets with anti-tank and anti-personnel bombs. The Marine airmen know they're hurting the Republican Guard, but admit that it is hard to assess just how much. They have dug in. They've hidden their tanks, they've dug in, and the time that you, we will really go and be able to destroy tanks in large numbers is when, in fact, they're going to come out, come out and fight when they're on the move. These U.S. Marine Harriers did just that last night, catching an Iraqi military convoy on the move. The warplanes pounced on the armored column as it crossed open desert, knocking out 24 tanks, personnel carriers, and supply trucks. Marines described it as the largest confirmed destruction of enemy armor in the war so far. It now seems likely that only when the Allied commanders are convinced that air power has softened up Saddam's army will they unleash the ground forces. For now, the foot soldiers have to be content with the most hazardous task of all, probing the enemy front lines by night, paving the way for their heavy artillery. Under cover of darkness, the big guns are rolling forward. The 20-foot barrels of U.S. Marine howitzers, only visible in the green light of a night scope camera, about to launch their heaviest assault yet on Iraqi forces dug in across the Kuwaiti border. The Marine gunners set their sights on an enemy supply depot. The coordinates punched into a computer that makes these guns the most accurate weapon in the Marines' arsenal. Accurate enough to cause a lot of death and destruction on old Saddam. We could shoot a gnat off Saddam Hussein's uh, backside. This time, though, it's a full frontal assault. At a minute to midnight, the howitzers spit out their opening salvos in unison. In just 13 minutes, the battery blasted off 72 rounds. The lack of enemy response suggests they've hit the mark. But the Marines don't take chances, moving out fast to avoid detection. Hit and run is the battle cry. Jeremy Thompson, News at 10, in eastern Saudi Arabia. An American commander stressed today the coalition would stick scrupulously to the Geneva Conventions in dealing with Iraqi prisoners of war. British padres have even been issued with a ten-line Arabic text so they could bury Iraqi prisoners killed in battle. Paul Davis reports now from a well-defended field hospital with 600 beds, where there's also a willingness to deal with casualties from both sides. Within artillery range of the Kuwaiti border, British medical teams practice the mass evacuation of casualties from the battlefield. If land forces become involved in this war, the number of dead and injured will be counted in thousands. The medics are making sure that they're as ready as they can be for that ultimate test. Dressing Station 5 Alpha has been assembled to provide the first line of specialist medical care for the British Army's 4th Armoured Brigade. It's the largest medical station of its type in the war zone, close enough to the front line to warrant round-the-clock protection. In conflict, the Puma helicopters will ferry real casualties back from their regiments. In the life-saving business where seconds are vital, these flying ambulances come into their own. 
The dressing station is in effect a clearing house. Once a patient has been stabilized, the extent of injuries assessed, there'll be a second helicopter journey to the field hospital behind the lines best suited to treat each soldier's wounds. And the numbers of helicopters available is really something more than many of us could have imagined. It's quite I mean, reassuring for everybody back at home and for parents and families to know that helicopters are here and as far as I'm concerned they will make that job of getting casualties back to the hospital that much easier. Among the 450 medics and ambulance drivers based at the station, British nurses and female medical officers. Their operating theatre inside the theatre of war. It's obviously quite scary knowing the artillery is uh, so, you know, only a, a few k's ahead of you, but we're out of range of the, uh, of the main lot of artillery. What about your parents? What do they think about you being quite this close to the fighting? Um, I'm not sure they really know I'm this close. Um, my mum's been very good. She says, um, this is a great adventure for you and you'll be able to look back on it. Um, I think she's just trying to find a, a way of coping with the idea. The medics say within four hours their tented clinics can be packed up, ready to move off after the frontline forces. Although 5th Armoured Field Ambulance are still in the process of erecting this dressing station, they don't expect to remain here for long. If British forces are ordered into Kuwait, the medical teams must follow to ensure that help for a wounded soldier is never more than a quick helicopter ride away. This is Paul Davis with the British Television News Pool in northeastern Saudi Arabia. The Pentagon has said the flow of oil into the Gulf is down to a trickle, but the slick is now 60 miles long and 15 miles wide as the oil spreads thinly across the surface of the sea. But as Peter Sharp reports, the effort to clean it up can't even get underway as the ships involved would still be within range of Iraqi artillery. The beaches of northern Saudi Arabia continue to show the effects of the huge mass of oil that's now doubled in size out at sea. It now contains some 460 million gallons of Kuwaiti crude. But according to Allied airmen who've flown over the slick, it's now beginning to break up. From the pilot debriefs that we've gotten that were out there, uh, the slick looks like it's dissipating and uh, the amount of flow coming out of that uh, loading head is uh, slowed down. At the huge industrial complex at Jubail, the largest in the country, the Saudi Coast Guard maintains its vigilance against Iraqi attack, but is powerless in the face of pollution. The saltwater canals provide the cooling system for the $30 billion plant. If they became fouled, it would close the complex down. Today, the British ambassador met the Saudi government to coordinate aid for Jubail's coastal defences. Oh, never in the history of the world has anybody pumped so much in such a short period of time in such a, an enclosed area like the Gulf. But uh, a lot of people uh, have expressed their wishes to come and to clean the birds and the animals that have been hurt. So we were very happy about the response. The response uh, to this environmental tragedy is just as, as good as honorable and as important and as massive as the response has been to the invasion of Kuwait. But until the slick moves south, out of the range of Iraqi artillery, work can't even begin on the cleanup operation. And the longer the crude oil sits off the coast of Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, the more damage it will cause. Peter Sharp, News at 10 on the Gulf Coast. It's clear tonight that the two opposing armies in this conflict are close enough to one another to strike at one another, albeit at a level well short of a full ground war. But just how close is that? One soldier said today, this is as close as you can get without paying taxes in the other country. From Saudi Arabia, it's back to Alastair in London. Alastair Stewart. The White House has dismissed as propaganda an interview given by President Saddam in which he hinted he would wage chemical warfare against the Allies. He told America's cable news network, CNN, that he would use weapons which equated those used against Iraq. The first television extract of the interview has just reached the West. In it, President Saddam says he has no doubts that he will win the war. Well, I have been Not even one in a million. So all the powers of great weaponry 
combined or united with all the countries of dirty money are grouped together against who? Against Iraq. هل بعد هذا الوصف لإنسان أن يقتنع بأن الله ليس معنا؟ A picture such as this one would would it leave anybody seeing it uh, convinced other than in the fact that God is on our side? The British commander in the Gulf said President Saddam's use of captured Allied airmen as human shields was what you would expect from the low-grade person he was. Iraq announced today that one of the captured airmen had been killed in an Allied bombing raid on the industry ministry building where he was held. It didn't give a name or nationality for the victim and there's no independent confirmation of the report. The Prime Minister is said to be personally appalled by the claim and, if true, would want it pursued as a war crime. Iraq's ambassador was summoned to the Foreign Office, where the government demanded the International Red Cross be allowed immediate access to all Allied prisoners. His reply was unpersuasive. He sort of mumbled. And I told him it wasn't good enough and we expected him to comply with the Geneva Co Conventions forthwith. Allied planes have flown more than 2,000 sorties in the last 24 hours, the crews under yet more pressure, knowing that captured comrades may not be held as prisoners of war, but at strategic targets they're ordered to bomb. The commander of British forces in the Gulf, visiting RAF tornado squadrons today, condemned Saddam's tactics. Well, first of all, it's quite outside the terms of Geneva Convention. Uh, secondly, I would say that it's the sort of behaviour you'd expect from a rather low-grade, second-hand uh, sort of person that he is, where the value of human life is, is of no consequence to him. It's just a means of uh, coinage to help him get where he wants himself personally to, be, to get to. A total of 29 Allied airmen, including 10 Britons, are listed as either missing or held prisoner in Iraq, British defence sources say relatives are being kept informed and until the claim has been confirmed, say it should be treated as possible propaganda. A Pentagon spokesman said tonight he thought the Iraqi pilots taking their aircraft to Iran were fleeing, that it was a sign of Iraqi weakness rather than any devious plot. He put the number gone so far at about 90. He said he knew nothing about reports of Iraqi ground troops in Iran. The flight of Iraq's best fighters to Iran poses one of the most intriguing questions of the war. Is Saddam Hussein behind the moving of the planes to safety, or are his Air Force generals acting on their own? The movement of the aircraft was observed by American AWACS radar planes flying over southern Iraq. This raised the question of why Allied fighters weren't able to shoot down the Iraqi jets before they reached Iran. Our aircraft are mainly in the south. We do have air superiority. We can operate where we want to. So if we catch them over Iraqi territory and we are able to, we will engage them and possibly shoot them down. Uh, we have not had that opportunity yet. The American military do not see Iraqi trickery behind the escape of the planes. I think that their uh, fleeing to Iran is more a sign of weakness than a sign of some devious plot. I can't tell you what the future holds, obviously, but that's what I think. General, but Saddam Hussein's Air Force commanders could be looking to a time when he is no longer in power. I would surmise, and it is speculation to some extent, that this is a move by some of the senior air officers in the Iraqi Air Force uh, to give them some power base, if you like, for some sort of military regime uh, after the war is over. Iranian leader Hashimi Rafsanjani seems determined to keep his country neutral in the war over Kuwait, despite calls from radical elements in his parliament for Iran to join Iraq in a holy war against America. His government says Iraqi fighters won't be allowed to fly from Iranian soil. These fighters would be seized in Iran as far as, uh, as long as the war is going on. When the crisis is over and the hostilities is ended, the airplanes uh, could be uh, returned. Tonight, the Americans are puzzled by Iraq's military strategy. I don't know what their strategy is because I'm kind of at a loss when I look at what they're doing to figure that strategy out. A. B. 
Their military capability has gone down because their air force has proved not to be an effective force. Their forces on the ground, very large forces in the Kuwaiti theater of operations, southern Iraq and, uh, and Kuwait, are sitting out in the open. They're being pounded every day. They're taking nothing for granted, however. Allied pilots say they'll be ready for them if Iraq's air force does come out fighting again. President Bush delivers his State of the Union address to Congress at uh, a little under four hours' time. The White House says it will include plans for the economy and domestic policy, but also his latest thinking on the Gulf. Some see the speech as one of the most important of President Bush's presidency and are looking for parallels with earlier Union addresses at the outbreak of war. Be one, five, four, five, six. On Capitol Hill tonight, unprecedented security. The president will speak to a Union at war and on terrorist alert. As he finished writing his speech inside, armed secret servicemen patrolled on the roof of the White House. I think the foreign ministers. The war will dominate tonight's address as it dominates his meetings. This with Egypt's foreign minister. Freedom of speech. Like other wartime presidents, his will be a message of confidence, rallying Congress round the flag. It is our will that is being tried and not our strength. Think back just 12 short months ago. 12 months ago, George Bush had just won a short war and his address never mentioned the Middle East. Today, democracy is restored, Panama is free. A bigger war now. He'll argue tonight that it's on course and that it is worth fighting. I think the president may be taking a look at a wider type of peace in the Middle East, encompassing Israel, encompassing the Palestinian problem. He'll tell an America in recession that war will not be a distraction. That's what Democrats want to hear. We have a crisis abroad in the Gulf. We also have a crisis here at home. We're in a recession, uh, and uh, we must deal with that. The White House said today the economy would turn by June, but the president will have no new initiatives tonight to make that happen. Mixed support for the president today, a poll finding that four out of five Americans support him on the Gulf, but only half on the economy. For the president, the challenge here tonight is to bind the country together behind a war that will grow more costly. It's a speech and a strategy vital not just to the campaign on the battlefield, but to the campaign for the re-election of George Bush. Bill Neely, News at 10, Washington. The Allies' success in pinpointing Iraqi targets as well as assessing damage afterwards depends to a large extent on spy satellites. Iraq has managed to keep some of its Scud missile launchers hidden even from satellite reconnaissance. The Allies thought their preparations meant they'd be getting a comprehensive picture of all enemy troop movements, as Lindsay Taylor of ITN's Channel 4 News reports. One. Booster ignition and liftoff. Some two months before the actual fighting, a key weapon in the high-tech war is fired. Houston now controlling, roll maneuver underway. The shuttle Atlantis carried a secret military payload believed to be the latest satellite technology, used now to track down Saddam's elusive Scud missiles and pinpoint other targets. This picture, taken from a commercial satellite last September, shows an oil terminal in Kuwait in some detail. But experts say leaked pictures from military spy satellites reveal that even greater clarity is available to the Allies, such as in this peacetime photograph of a naval dockyard in the Soviet Union. Uh, and this is a satellite which uh, has a resolution of about 30 centimeters, probably slightly better. But now what you can see are a number of very interesting things. Here is a van parked on the road. And then there are buildings where you can see the windows. And these are normal size windows, and that gives you an idea of what uh, they might have seen uh, in, 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 um, in Baghdad. Using photographs taken at different angles from 150 miles above the Earth's surface, military analysts are able to build three-dimensional targets to brief bombing crews. The low orbit means that, unlike communication satellites, spy satellites do not hover over the observation area but circle the Earth about every two hours, this means they see the target for only two or three seconds. By the time the orbit's completed, the Earth has moved on, so they're no longer over the same point. And while it is possible to program their path to come over the same spot more often, 
and to use several satellites, it still only gives intermittent looks at the target area. The easiest way to fool a satellite is obviously not to be there when the satellite is looking at you. A mobile scud can pull into a ravine, under a bridge, or into a garage somewhere. Any land battle will show just how effective satellite intelligence has been, but given the sheer number of surveillance methods being used, it's increasingly difficult for the Iraqis to avoid detection. In South Africa, Mr. Nelson Mandela and Chief Butalezi, the two black leaders, meet to try to end the civil war in the township, so report next. Plus, how it's hard to keep your head above water, even in the southeast. And how old people need to live out their days with dignity and privacy. That's in a couple of minutes. Is a two-litre engine with six cylinders smoother than one with four? BMW are prepared to put money on it. The BMW 320i. Murray, we'd better rehearse that again. All you've got to say is penguin. Penguin. A one of these. One of these. Chocolate is biscuits. Chocolate is biscuits. In the world. In the world. Great. Now you've only got the one line, so really make the most of it. Penguin. One of the chocolate is biscuits in the world. Marvellous. Don't you really think so? A tiny triumph. Now let's try it underwater, shall we? Will somebody please p -p -p pick up those penguins? If you need something quickly, call Talking Pages. We'll help you find the right shops and services in your area. Hello, Talking Pages. Ah, I wonder if you can help. Yes, we have three plumbers in your area who have an emergency service. Thank you so much. Is he all right? Yes, he's just looking for the fish. Call Talking Pages mm. on Brighton 542222 and we'll do the searching for you. Oh! Oh! Don't delay. Pick up your new Argos catalogue today. The two main black South African leaders, Mr Nelson Mandela and Chief Butelezi, settled some differences and called on their supporters to stop fighting each other. It was the first time they'd met since Mr. Mandela was released almost a year ago. Thousands have died in township battles between ANC supporters and Zulus. The handshake that could herald the end of a five-year conflict. Nelson Mandela and Chief Gacha Butelezi last met nearly three decades ago, before Mandela's lengthy imprisonment and before the beginning of the power struggle between the ANC and Chief Butelezi's Inkata movement. 
Today, delegates greeted each other like the old friends they once were, rather than the political enemies they'd become. And despite what one delegate described as exceedingly tough talking by Chief Butelezi in particular, the two sides tonight emerged with the news that a major peace agreement has been achieved. You can see not only from the warmth between us and from our body language, but also from the mood of our delegations that in fact the, it was, the meeting was a, a, a complete success precisely because we didn't skirt issues. If we had not addressed the points raised by Prince Butelezi, we would not have achieved this breakthrough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the important point is that we have made progress Absolutely. and uh, we have the hope that uh, the measures that we have taken will help us to consolidate that breakthrough. Thousands have been killed in the conflict between Zulu-speaking supporters of Inkata and predominantly Khorza followers of the ANC. To give muscle to the call for peace, a joint commission will be established to monitor violations of the agreement. And Nelson Mandela and Chief Butelezi will together visit areas most severely affected. Hopes are now high that the apparently endless cycle of attack and revenge can finally be broken. There are still substantial points of difference between the two organizations, and it will take a while before the agreements reached here permeate through to rank and file. But for the first time in five years of conflict, there's clear agreement about the need for unity. Complete agreement that the black majority must close ranks in negotiations with the de Klerk government. Mike Hanna, News at 10, Durban. Here, the leader of the opposition, Mr Kinnock, told the Prime Minister today that Britain was being pushed back into a slump by the policy of high interest rates. Businessmen say the prospects for their companies are worse now than they've been for more than 10 years. A survey by the Confederation of British Industry says manufacturers are expecting a big drop in output as the recession deepens. For the first time, economic malaise is gripping picturesque market towns more tightly than the manufacturing heartlands. Newbury in Berkshire benefited from commercial expansion alongside the M4 motorway in the early 80s. Computer companies brought jobs and spending power. Now they're contracting. This local computer firm supplies the motor industry. Orders have fallen, so 40 staff have been laid off. A lot of people now are on the job market and we get an awful lot of job applications for all skills, almost daily. And what do you think this tells you about uh, the state of the industry? I think the whole industry is going through a period of... Uh, recession and also reorganization and restructuring and until this is carried out I think there will be considerable unemployment in the computer industry. Another of Newbury's staple industries is experiencing its own slowdown. Racing has suffered in the chill economic climate, five yards in the area have closed and more than a hundred jobs have been lost. Trainer Oliver Sherwood says there's less money coming into racing. And even a well-established training stable like his own is not immune to recession. It's affected us uh, tremendously. Um, the owners or potential owners are not coming into the game as much as they were uh, 18 months ago, a year ago. Uh, and uh, there isn't the money around as what there was, as I say, 18 months ago. So spending falls and Newbury's retailers suffer. Offices are unlet and shops boarded up. Company failures are up by a third in a year, an alarming development for the town. I think we will feel a white-collar recession. Um, it is something that we have not been used to. There's no doubt the banks and the other financial institutions are cutting back significantly on their staff levels and are looking for major cost savings through their staff levels. The CBI survey and others show that the recession is biting hardest in service industries and in prosperous areas of the south of England. It's very different from the manufacturing recession of the early 1980s, and for the government, possibly more damaging politically. Hugh Pym, News at 10, at Newbury in Berkshire. Old people in some residential homes don't get enough privacy, a report said today. A survey of more than 100 registered old people's homes by a group called Council and Care for the Elderly said some residents are regularly humiliated, having to get undressed and take baths in front of others. 
a resident enjoying a precious moment of privacy in her own room. In old people's homes, it's a rarity. The charity found that despite paying an average of £200 a week, nearly half of residents aren't able, like this woman, simply to be alone. Well, I like it because I get my own privacy. I do, I'm free to do what I want to do without other people watching. Counselling care says in this home people are treated with dignity. Elsewhere, they're often forced to undress, bathe and use commodes in public. They say this is an exception, a toilet with a lock on the door. In shared rooms, one in four homes expect residents to use commodes while not even screened by a curtain. Most people are forced to use them within hearing distance of others. This care worker was shown into a room by a member of staff who didn't knock on the door first. A resident was sitting on the toilet. She didn't say anything to the resident at all and didn't apologise. And instead she apologised to me um, and said afterwards that it didn't, that in fact it didn't really matter that we'd barged into that man's room when he'd been on the commode because he was quite confused anyway. And that's, that's another thread that we found throughout this whole survey, um, that a resident's rights including their right to privacy, actually decreases the frailer they become, whether it's mental or physical frailty. And we were surprised, in a sense, at the conditions that elderly people in many homes had come to accept in a relatively uncomplaining way. Now, we don't think that that means it isn't in, privacy isn't important to them. It does mean that the system has battered them down and that it's for those of us who are in positions of relative power to take action on this matter. The charity says it's scandalous that the elderly are routinely humiliated. Restrictive rules are applied to all. Whether or not residents are at risk, they're rarely allowed to enjoy peace behind their own locked door. Lisa Hampley, News at 10, North London. Now cricket and a century by the England captain Graham Gooch, his first in a test in Australia, helped his side draw the fourth test in Adelaide. He was man of the match with 117. England, needing 472 to win, managed 335 for five. Australia were already two tests up in the Ashes series. To begin with, Gucci's only object was to bat out the day for an honourable draw. 450 on the last day would be an outrageous miracle. But when his partner, Atherton, began to open out with some fine strokes for his half-century and the pair's 100... And then the captain went to his first ever test century in Australia, his 13th in all. There was just a glimmer of hope of an unlikely win. But when the stand had gone over 200, Reed and Marsh combined to end the captain's innings, one of his best ever. And then Atherton went in similar fashion. The chase, if it ever existed, effectively ended. Briefly, Lamb continued to take the attack to the Australians. But when he was out, and then Gower got an awful decision, it was all really over. England had salvaged pride and can now look forward to the final test with more confidence than at any time in this series. Soccer, the Chelsea chairman, Mr Ken Bates, resigned from the Football League Management Committee today and then said he'd try to get re-elected straight away. Some committee members were unhappy with his criticism of league rules when Chelsea was fined a fortnight ago for making irregular payments to players. Tonight, soccer in the FA Cup fourth round replay. Southampton 2, Coventry 0. In the Barclays League Division 4, Darlington 1, Gillingham 1. Hartlepool 3, Stockport 1. In the Tennis Scottish Cup third round, Rangers 2, Dunfermline 0. In the third round replay, Dundee United 2, East Fife 1. In the B&Q Scottish League Division 1, Brechin 3, Clyde Bank 2. In Division 2, Arbroath 1, Alloa 1. East Stirling at the bottom 1, Cowdenby 3. Stirling the leaders 3, Montrose 0. And tonight's main headline on the Gulf War, Royal Navy helicopters have sunk five Iraqi gunboats in an engagement 20 miles north of the Kuwaiti border with Saudi Arabia. Several other gunboats were badly damaged. And one other story, the anti-terrorist squad now say that a fire at an exclusive London club tonight was not caused by a bomb. They say it was an electrical fire. Earlier, the London Ambulance Service had said the detonator of a bomb had exploded at the club, Brooks of St James's Street. And that's the news at 10. More news on ITV later tonight. Good night. As the Gulf War heads towards week three, Phil Donahue joins forces with John Stapleton for a time the place special. 
London Talks to New York, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Well, today proved yet another grey and grisly day, but there's a faint ray of hope as far as tomorrow goes. And that's because we've blue skies edging towards us from both directions, slowly eating away at all this relentless cloud. And in fact, here we are cheating just a touch by thinning down that cloud just to prove that, yes, Britain is nestling underneath it all. So tonight, the very thickest cloud of all will be very much spilling down the western side of the country, giving off bits and pieces of light rain, drizzle, some sleet, and even snow on the higher ground, but really very light and patchy, nothing to write home about. Another thing to watch out for tonight is with temperatures taking a dip in those clearing skies, there could well be mist and fog patches swirling around. So here are those temperatures, a very chilly night. Temperatures hovering at around freezing or even below that where there are breaks in the cloud. Obviously take extra care if you're out and about on the roads. As we go into tomorrow, that thick cloud, like a finger spilling down the country, will be more or less stuck there, again giving off some light rain, but this time with thinner cloud either side of it. So at least we stand something of a chance of seeing the sunshine struggling through better than the grey gloomy skies we've been seeing recently. Temperatures come in at around 2 to 3 degrees. That's only the mid-30s. That's all from me. Good night.